I've recently heard a report from a congregation somewhere in the eastern United States. Allegedly, this congregation invited an ordained, credentialed minister to present solid Bible Seventh-day Adventist teachings as a guest speaker at their church, somehow against the wishes of their conference. The pastor of that local church, disagreeing with their decision, has told them that he no longer recognizes the leaders as, a, as the board. He has unilaterally declared that this church is in rebellion toward the conference. This pastor is threatening that the local church will be dissolved and the members would be removed from membership. The pastor gave an ultimatum from the pulpit eventually that the, uh, the congregation members had to comply or else leave the building and leave their membership behind in the official church. The pastor stated he no longer recognizes the leaders as members and demands that they turn over their financial data for the church within 24 hours or face the consequences. So here's the question. Is any of this a legitimate exercise of pastoral authority? Let's see if the Bible has some help for us on that. But let's look at Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. And God's word says this, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So a question, who is Jesus speaking to here? The apostles or the disciples? Yes, they're the apostles, but the scripture calls them the 11 disciples. Look back at verse 16. Not every member is called to be an apostle, but all members are called to be disciples. The command of Jesus is for them, not particularly as apostles, as church leaders, but as disciples as regular members. Now, how much authority does Jesus have? Verse 18 tells us Jesus says he has all authority. Jesus commands them, if they are his disciples, they are to go. They are to make disciples of all the nations. Disciples are to make more disciples. The authority of the church, thus we see it comes from God the Father and has been given to Jesus. How much authority has been given to Jesus? All authority has been given to Jesus. From Jesus, he gives some of that authority to the disciples, that is, to the membership of his church. So the authority rests with the membership. Pastors and presidents do not dole out authority as they will, but the authority rests with the members. God grants authority to the members. If you have an experience with the Lord Jesus, if you're a part of his end-time group that believes what his Bible teaches, then his authority has been passed to you, some measure of his authority. So where does a pastor then get his authority? Well, just as Jesus received authority given to him from the Father and passes that authority onward to the church, so too a pastor receives authority from the church and exercises his authority, and I'm quoting now, quote, in harmony with all the plans and policies of the local church, unquote. That's the church manual on page 79, the current edition. Now, there's more to say about how the limitations of power here and there work in the church, and more we will say as we go through this series. But consider this crucial piece of information from the church manual on page 28. The Seventh-day Adventist form of governance is representative, which recognizes that authority rests in the membership and is expressed through duly elected representatives at each level of organization, with executive responsibility delegated to representative bodies and officers for the governing of the church at each separate level. Now, I hope you heard what the World Church says. I hope you heard what we have agreed upon as a global body of believers in Jesus here. The way this denomination is governed echoes what Jesus said in Matthew 28. Authority rests in the membership, not because we want it to, not because it looks good on the page, not because it sounds, you know, like it sounds like it should be. It's because Jesus places it there. And we'll have more to say about this as this series progresses. But this is a vital principle, and it's vital to the health of God's church. But for now, let's do this. Let's go back, and let's go back and look at those claims that were made at the beginning uh, from that report we had, and let's see if, uh, if they're right or wrong. Does that pastor, if this is as it is said, did he have the authority to make those kind of, of commands and demands and coerce his members? So can the pastor determine for himself 
whether the church board is valid. Well, no, that's not in his authority. The church, if the election was handled correctly, then the local church has elected those people who serve on the church board as representatives of them. The church board represents the local congregation. And so they are duly elected. Unless they've resigned without being coerced into resigning, uh, they're still current members of the board. It doesn't matter if the pastor doesn't like their haircut. It doesn't matter if the pastor doesn't like their theology. Frankly, it doesn't matter if the conference tells the pastor uh, don't listen to your board. It simply doesn't matter because the authority rests at the membership. So no, no pastor has the arbitrary authority to dissolve his church board. Absolutely not. So what about this next one? Can the pastor declare that the church is in rebellion or even say the conference? Can they just declare arbitrarily that a congregation is in rebellion and uh, say, well, we're just, we're dissolving you. Can they do that? No. <laughs> no, because look, you're part of a sisterhood of churches. The conference president can't do this. The conference executive committee can't do this, okay? So the conference, the general conference president can't call up and tell the conference to disband that church. Uh, what they can do is this. They, if they're certain that they wanna push this thing all the way, they can call for a, in the upcoming constituency meeting, they could call for it to be, its status to be changed or it to be dissolved, uh, or they could hold a special constituency meeting just to consider that point. They would have to give weeks, if not months, of notice about that meeting. It would cost them thousands upon thousands of dollars to hold a constituency meeting. And then, if they hold the meeting, they're going to have to make a compelling case why one of the sisterhood of churches should be removed. And you know what? Every, there's an interesting thing here, because every delegate who would come to that session, they've all got to be thinking, too, you know, well, if, right now, if I act to uh, go along with this and disband this church, for, for crazy reasons, what's to keep the, these conference leaders from disbanding my church at some future time for some crazy reason? So every one of those delegates coming to that constituency meeting, they would all have a vested interest in seeing to it that fairness is extended to every church in the sisterhood of churches. So no, no, and no. <laughs> so let's look at this other item as well. What about this idea that the pastor could stand up maybe in the pulpit and say, come on to my side. If, you're, if, you're, if you agree with me, you're, you're in supporting the conference. If you disagree with me, why then stand up and leave and just leave because you're no longer members anymore. And you stand up and leave and take your, your membership is, is dissolved because you disagree with me. Can a pastor do that? And the answer is no. Because you see, Again, for a member to have their membership withdrawn, the church has obligations toward each member. If a person's to be brought up, say, for church discipline, let's say, for whatever reason, they're brought up for discipline, there has to be a business meeting, there has to be fair notice given, the person, one by one, each person who would be under that uh, consideration, have their membership withdrawn, has to be given a, an opportunity to represent their own case, uh, to call perhaps witnesses in their own defense, and then the group would vote uh, whether their membership is, uh, continues or not, whether they're placed under discipline or not. So the pastor has, ha, doesn't even, can't do that at all. It's, it's, it's absurd. So no, the pastor cannot call and just say, everybody who leaves now isn't a member anymore. That's, that, that, that authority doesn't exist because authority has been, been, it rests with the membership. To be fair, maybe this conference has not instructed this pastor and he doesn't know. He doesn't know his limitations on authority. And some people say, well, you know, the, the church manual is a big problem. There's a lot of problems in the church manual. Well, no, the church manual is not a perfect document, but I'll tell you what, in many respects, and we'll see it here just in the next presentations, in very many respects, the church manual does a great deal to limit. It limits the authority of the pastor. It limits the authority of the conference president. There's all kinds of limitations of authority built in to the church system through the church manual. So I'll share the authorities, the page numbers, etc. for everything that I've shared with you. I'll be sharing it as we continue in this series. But let's say that this thing that we heard, this report, let's say that it actually happened about that way. Uh, what then? Are those people like not part of the church anymore? Or uh, are the members of the board not members of the board anymore? Well, of course they're members of the board. Of course they still continue to have their church authority. Of course they continue to have their church membership. So yes, they continue to be members of the board. Yes, they continue to have their church membership. The pastor simply didn't have that authority. He could not act on an authority he didn't have. And so that church has every right that it had before the pastor had his little moment. And the church manual still tells you and him 
that the pastor works in harmony with the policies of the local church. He doesn't abrogate them. He doesn't throw them away. The local pastor is subject to the decisions of the local church board, not the other way around. Not at all. (laughs) So take heart. Don't be discouraged. Take a deep breath. Be calm. Uh, Respect your leaders, even when they act disrespectfully. Don't be coerced by them. Don't be bullied by them because that's dangerous for you and it's especially dangerous for them. Respect their legitimate exercise of authority and disregard their illegitimate exercise of authority. You know, you want them to be saved. You want them in the kingdom. Seek to work with them. But yes, there might be some corrections that they need to make to get the line, to get the understanding, the correct understanding that authority rests in the membership, not in the pastor. Friends, the Lord is with his church. Don't, uh, don't run for the hills. Hang on tight. Let's just straighten this out. And the Lord will bless. Keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. We're going to find out in the, in the next few presentations here all kinds of authorities that the church, the local church has through its church board. The pastor doesn't have those authorities. The local church does. Wait until you see. God bless you. Hang in there and pray. Pray for yourself, your congregation and our leaders, the ones that are on track and the ones that are errant. Pray that God will guide and lead his people in this crazy hour. God has the help we need to cut through all the nonsense in his church.